Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. <laughs> Welcome to Drinking Bros. There is some conversations that we have just before we go on air, and we're like, eh, should we be recording that or not? Yeah. This is definitely one. We got uh, James Altucher. Um, Altucher. Al- no, he, say, he you said gotta it. say it faster. Cause. He said it earlier, <laughs> and I'm repeating what he said. He said, say it. James, Sid, Sid, tell me, tell the audience what you told me right before we went on air. Okay, you pronounced my last name like I'll touch her fast. Altucher. <laughs> And so whenever, whenever I've been on like, you know, different news shows and stuff uh, throughout the years and the anchor always asks that, how do I pronounce your name? Yep. And I always say that, you know, if it's a male or female anchor and, you know, usually they start their this segment starts with them laughing. But now I'm wondering, like with cancel culture, well, you know, does this is that enough even to get people canceled? Is that the line? Like, where's the line where if you st- step over that line, it gets someone canceled? That's a good question. Uh, you've canceled yourself four times, uh, at least. I've, I have at canceled least. myself quite a bit, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah but it's, you always bounce back, so it's fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you're the happiest dude on the planet. Has anybody ever said uh, Phil Spector? Uh, like no. a, a Phil Spector stand-in, because um, no. you've, you've got well, the mostly hair. Mostly because I haven't murdered any hookers lately. Well, <laughs> well, not lately. What's the statute of limitation on that? <laughs> day's not over yeah. yet either. Yes, day's not over. Day's so we not over. Where where are you at? Are you being held hostage somewhere? I am in Key Biscayne, Florida, after being thrown out of New York City, after uh, being banned from New York City. I'm on like the no-fly list in JFK. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let, I mean, and let's let's hop into it here. Did you get banned because uh, going after Seinfeld? No, Seinfeld went after me. Yeah, he didn't go after like, Seinfeld. And, and by the way, I, I I will freely admit I was a small target for him. He if I was guiding his career, which you know he doesn't need my advice, but I would have picked a better target than me. <laughs> but I wrote this article in August called, and I've been writing books and articles for twenty years. Like this has been my thing, and I've written about all sorts of topics, anything from finance to self help to college to education to to home ownership. To everything and and I've also written books about how I've gone broke many times and and been depressed and suicidal and how I bounced back. But I wrote this one article in August. Mm-hmm. New York City is dead forever. Here's why. And I love New York. I write about all the reasons why I love New York. But I felt like people were in denial. There's all these restaurants and businesses getting closed. There's hundreds of thousands of people going unemployed. There's food lines around the block. There's People, you know, there's the so-called exodus, uh, like U-Haul is booked for two months now trying to get out of New York. Yep. So I wrote about these things and, and some other stuff. And everybody was everybody in New York was upset. So Joe Rogan actually read my article on his podcast. Glenn Beck read it out loud. Rush Limbaugh read it out loud. But everybody in New York City was reasonably upset. And that went on for about 10 days. Like I lost friends. Ex-girlfriends wrote articles about me. <laughs> Like it was really, you know, like everybody went after it. It was the most wow. hate I've ever gotten on an article ever. And I've gotten serious hate on prior that's, articles. That's why I've, I've started funny. only dating illiterate women because of that. That way they can't write anything after the fact. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I dated a, uh, uh, someone who called herself a writer, and that was the problem. She hadn't written anything in a long time, and this gave her an excuse. That's like acting. People, people who have never acted anything will call themselves actor, but you never hear that from a banker. No. Oh, oh, she 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 also calls herself an actor, having last acted twelve years ago. Something like that. So, uh, by the way, I, I was that's what she does for a living. I, I was so, one of those people, by the way, who read your article out loud on uh, on my other show on on Ross Patterson Revolution. We read your article out loud. The way the the reason why I said you went after Seinfeld is, you know, he had this response that was kind of zingy in the press, and then you came back after that and said. Dude, why would you go after me and blah, 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 blah. That, that's the only thing that I remember simply because you were the one, in my mind, who stood up to big bad Jerry Seinfeld and his fucking hundred cars that are in a garage in you know, the Upper East Side yeah. and everything. And we, on, on our show, were championing you because you, you went after him after that and didn't back down to I that. I mean, I understand both perspectives, though, because Jerry's been there a long time. And there is something about New York grit, as it were, right, that people feel like if you're talking bad about New York, it, they take it personally. Right, for, but, for, but here's the thing. I mean, I... Your, your, your article was all, like, I mean, factual statements I, about commercial real estate and all this other stuff. It wasn't like you were saying New Yorkers are pussies. You know yeah. I mean? Right, the, the, only, the only non-fact I had in the article was uh, the fact that I thought, like, people were saying, oh, everything will go back to normal after a vaccine. But my point was, is that 
The one thing different uh, now uh, compared to other crisis points is that bandwidth is 10 times greater than it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So you can actually do like Zoom meetings. People people can work remote. Mm -hmm. And that was the, everything else in the article was fact. So there was no like right. like mm -hmm. people were tweeting like I don't need some guy from Idaho telling me that New York is dead. I've never even been to Idaho, so I don't know where they were getting <laughs> stuff like that. But the it only like non-fact I had was this point. And by the way, that's a fact. It was just my opinion that's going to lead to more yeah. remote work. Yeah, you and did, now, so, you yesterday, did, you did this is like that. eight months later or nine months later, yesterday, the New York Times even said, uh, and, and by the way, Jerry Seinfeld posted his op-ed against me in the New York Times, but the New York Times said in their article yesterday that... Uh, Remote work is is here to stay. Here's the mm -hmm. title. Remote work is here to stay. Mm -hmm. Manhattan may never be the same. Yeah. yeah. Guess what? Seinfeld said the exact opposite in his op-ed against me in the New York Times. He said nobody likes remote work yeah. and Manhattan's going to be the same. It and my point to him was he from the day the pandemic started, he was not in New York. I was there the whole time. He was there in the in the Hamptons. And who is he worked he's been working remote since 1977. Like what is <laughs> He's saying everybody loves working in the office. Are you kidding me? Like, do you? Most people work in like these shitty cubicles. Like, it's better. Like, what are they? Who likes to work in a cubicle? Nobody does. Like, you have your fake friends and all the cubicles around you. You can't go to the bathroom because you might be shitting next to your boss. Like, <laughs> yeah, and and what me and my wife were saying was, yes, New York is not dead if you're fucking rich. Seinfeld is fucking rich. Well, Therefore, it's like, yeah, to him, it's not going to be dead because he's fine throughout the fucking pandemic and whatever he's going to do. Uh, I, I, again, live in the Upper East Side in his hundred car fucking garage and all that shit. It's not dead for him or people of his ilk, but for everybody else who's a normal worker, a waiter, a bartender, uh, everybody you described uh, in, in your article, they're fucked. And yes, it, it is dead. Well, no. yeah, and, and here's the thing. It's not like... First off, everyone's saying, oh, things will, will get back to normal. Well, okay, there's already, I don't know, some huge percentage, so let's call it 50% of restaurants that have gone out of business forever. So who's going to tell the owner, not only the owners, but the employees of those businesses, hey, man, just wait a while and stay unemployed and bankrupt because things, you'll be able to reopen that business. No one's reopening their businesses. 80,000 small businesses might have already gone bankrupt in New York. We don't really know the exact number yet, but it's trending towards that. And and then you have all everybody. When my article came out, every, every financial firm responded like, you know, Goldman Sachs said, we're never leaving New York. Well, guess what? Not only were they saying that from New Jersey, where their offices are, <laughs> but but they moved the Goldman Sachs, the asset management part, moved to Miami along with 70 other financial firms. Mm -hmm. So it's like everyone was just full of shit. And here's the thing. OK, all these people are calling me and saying, James, guess what? Real estate market is booming here. And I'm like, oh, yeah. What what price did you sell your house at? And everybody was over. $10 million. The, the, the low end or even the middle end, because 10 million is quite a bit of the high end, the, the low end is 20% down. No one can sell their house. So everybody is just like only from their perspective. Like if they have, they have no empathy for anyone mm -hmm. else. If you have a hundred million dollars, like, well, of course it's not dead. Right. I, I just yeah. bought a $30 million <laughs> apartment there. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. Well, what so about all the people who had to go home and live with their parents because they yeah, could yeah. not get a job because they got unemployed because they went out of business. One in four New Yorkers have not paid rent in a year. And you think, oh yeah, well screw the landlords, all those rich people. A lot of it actually is mom and pop landlords who are renting yep. out their apartment so they can have some income. And those people are not getting income now. They're they're starving. And so and some of them, by the way, are, How are, people are dying just not in denial about this. Yeah. And some, some of them are actually dying. So th this is an actual thing in New York where if you're getting older because rent is so high there, Dan, mm -hmm. um, and they know that they don't have much time left on this earth, you can actually put in a bid and pay for your uh, essentially apartments if you want uh, and then wait for these people to die so you can get in because it's so expensive that's, there. Uh, that's very macabre, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of fucked up. It, it's, but that it's, is what happens in New York. Like, yes. You, look, yeah, you sure. don't look at the... In New York's the one place where nobody looks at the real estate list, listings. You just look at the obituaries. Like, <laughs> yeah. To find a new apartment. Yeah, and it's... Uh, I mean, if you combine that with all the stuff going on with, with commercial real estate, the deflationary spiral, I think you referenced that. That's an economic phrase. I think you referenced it in this article, yeah. actually, where... These businesses don't come back, right? Do, do new businesses come in or do, as has happened in New York in the past, do they convert into loft housing and things like that? And who's going to pay for it? I mean, 
from, from the commercial real estate where a place may have gotten twenty five to forty five thousand dollars a month in rent, right? For a, for a commercial space is now going to be converted into multiple lofts. But are they going to be able to make that much money back up when the housing market, like the rental market, in your crashes? Because it's going to, right? Yeah. And this is all well, happening. Commercial all at the real same time. estate. I don't know what the hell is going to happen there because you look at the Time Life Building, which is like the seminal Midtown mm. office building. Like, and and New York's got the biggest Midtown in the country, and it's the financial capital of the world. So we can't ignore it. So the Time Life Building could be right now legally. 50% full, that's the law right now. Right. But it's only, on any particular day, it's only 5% full instead of 50%. New York already has gone remote. Most businesses that are like, could be remote, any business that could be remote is remote. Right. And and they're not coming back. Like I ask people I mean, who, are, who are living in different places now, hey, are you remote forever? And they're like, well, the company kind of winked at us and said, we'll let you know when you could come back. They're, by the way, why would they why ever let would them they? come back? Why? They don't. Yeah. Yeah. JP Morgan's leasing something like two thirds less office space, or, or they soon will be, and they're saving money. So here's what it turns out: they're saving money. It turns out, employee every survey done, employees are more productive now mm -hmm. than when they have to commute three hours a day, and more than fifty percent of employees are happy working from home. You know, right. some want to work in the office and some want hybrid, but more than 50% have stated that they are happier working at well, home. Well, I bet if there was some kind of alternative to the socialization part of work, then they would then it would be a much higher percentage of people that didn't mind working remotely, right? I think a lot yeah, of and, people, the most and, socialization they get is day-to-day -day at work. Correct, and now yeah. And missing that, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, like affairs happen at work. Yeah. That's the main socialization. I'm trying that happens to get laid, son. If you don't go to work, how can you have an affair? Well, AshleyMadison.com, I guess. But then you can't meet up in New York without wearing a mask. Yeah, but it saves your HR department. Because now yeah. you're not getting these these uh, sexual harassment suits and everything else. And I had a conversation do you, do with a business owner. Do you need an HR department at that point? You just no. like Facebook's moderation team. No, and, and, that's, and that's the thing. So you don't need an HR department anymore. Um, you also don't need to worry about workers' comp. So mm. if somebody gets hurt in the job or whatever it is, like, yeah, hey, you were sure. at your house. If you trip over your own fucking dog well, and, and, and break your arm, congratulations. Does that make workers' comp more complicated, though? Like if somebody's on the job at their home, they're claiming part of their home now on their taxes. I mean, there's a tax issue now as well, right? If you're working from home, then yeah. a certain portion yeah. of, your, of your square footage is now. That's right, yes. I mean, this, this is a whole new territory, although I think it's great. So do as, I. As long as here's oh. what here's what will happen though. The employers will take advantage. They still want their ten hours a day, mm -hmm. and they just want more efficiency out of it. Yeah. It's not like they're gonna be like, oh, we're actually getting all we need in four hours a day. So you guys take the rest of the day off. You think that's fucking happening? No way. No. Right? They're gonna grind the motherfucking Christ out of these people until oh. they have nothing left. Do you enjoy right, it down I, there? Are you like, are you happy to get out of New York? Uh, n no, not really, because I spend. Mo I'm a very you know, I like being indoors and most of my work, I'm a, I, I write and mm. I do other things and I, it just involves being indoors. I never particularly care where I am, but I, but I have family in New York. I have friends in New York. I grew up all, or it, I was born in New York. I spent my entire adult life there and a good chunk of my childhood. And I love it. I love New York, the city, but at some, there's nothing wrong with living elsewhere. And I think what's happening now is the, the good news is all of the talent, in the country used to go to places like New York or San Francisco or LA. And I, and I don't, I'm not putting anyone down. It's just like, if you want to work on wall street, you got to go where wall street is. If right. you want to work in Hollywood, you got to go where Hollywood is. If you want to work in the Silicon Valley job, you got to go to Silicon Valley, but now you don't have to. And the talent of all these major Metro areas is dispersing throughout the country. So you're getting a tech scene in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And of course in Austin or in Denver or in park city, Utah, or in, Places in Montana. You know the, the city growing the fastest right now in the U.S.? Boise, Idaho. So, beautiful. Boom. Like, well, it's beautiful you know, there. And I, and I think a lot of that has to do with where you want to live in your quality of life. Because I think a lot of people re-examine that after the pandemic where they're like, all right, well, do I really love where I live? Do, do, should I have a yard? Uh, I have children. You know, I have dogs. I have pets. Um, can I leave and not be in the cities that you just mentioned? And I think a lot of them did some soul searching over this past year. And they said, yes, I would love to get the fuck out of here if, if I'm able to. And most jobs are saying, go ahead. You can work remotely, pick your city. And I think that's what you're, what you're seeing happen right now. Now everybody's kind of picking their favorites and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, look, a lot of New Yorkers are going to Florida. A lot of them are going to, to North Carolina. Uh, and then a lot of people from LA and uh, San Francisco and Silicon Valley and all those guys are coming down to Austin, Texas. Right. There's, uh, a lot of, there's a lot of weird shit. There's a lot of second 
second, third order effects happening, though. You mentioned Idaho. So there's a bill that's being discussed in Idaho right now. It's RS28866. And this is paraphrasing. Well, I have you, a, you're like up on your Idaho legislation. What's up with that? He I, loves it. I, I, I pay attention to anything that involves civil, civil liberties uh, and, right, the, and cool. the attack on them. So uh, this one is, this is about education. So the bill, this is, I'm paraphrasing what someone else wrote, uh, and, but I've looked into this bill as accurate. So the bill is trying to make it so that any discussion or education on any historical events that regard sex, gender, or race will be punished by the Board of Education, right? Uh, I, that it, is so... It, Unbelievable. I, I, like, I assume that you've read The Calling of the American Mind or at least know what it is. Yeah. And and I mean, what the fuck? I, I, I'd love to, because you, you have this new show. We haven't mentioned it yet, but uh, or not a show, but a new piece of material coming out with Charlemagne the God about race and American stuff. And we'll get to that later. But the way that we're training kids and even even older people now to think, to, to emotionally reason and to, to catastrophize well, is really fucking a problem right now. I mean, let, let's start even foundational because before we even get there what is the role of school period and like if everyone says oh well you, it's an education how will your kids learn to read how will your kids learn to you know add numbers trust me they're gonna learn to do what they need to do like everyone knows how to add and most people most people in the u.s 99 percent are are literate and whether they're homeschooled or school in school the the, the, the common curriculum is just bs and I always ask people like just simple historical questions, the kind of thing that we learned every single grade of school and no one ever knows the answers. Like I even don't know the answers and I have to ask the, and I'm asking the questions like, <laughs> like, sh like forget Charlemagne, the radio host for a second, mm -hmm. Charlemagne, the, the European king who united all of Europe and was the greatest king in European history. Right. I asked people, when was Charlemagne born? And because if people tell me, oh, I studied European history in college or, or high school, or whatever, you learn this every single year of, of high school. When was Charlemagne the King born? Without Googling it, most people can't answer me within 1623. years. No, no, it was in the eighth century, right around the time that Islam came about. Actually, that's. What oh I my God! You, you, I, Idaho legislation and Charlemagne. You can get it. <laughs> oh you're yeah, like, look, yeah, you're, you're 750, 754 AD. It's pinky in the brain over here on this side. So, <laughs> uh, just so you know what you're getting here. But either but, way, yeah. we end up taking over the world, so it's fine, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the lesson from pinky in the brain. You need one guy that's drinking fucking cider at two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> 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 Although I'm on weed and Adderall, let's be real. Uh, we were talking about that before the show too. Yeah. Um, so I look, what do you think is going to happen then with all of it? Um, with, with the kids and everything else? Cause I, I get two kids. Do you have any kids? Yeah. I have five kids. What the yeah. fuck, man? How no, hot is your wife? I, well, his pullout game is weak. We know that. Yeah, real weak. You decided <laughs> well, well, to have all five. She had three, and I had two, and and we we and and then we met. God, you had you okay. should have had one more before you could have gone full Brady bunch. Yeah, full Brady on. I that. know. Well, not full Brady bunch. I don't have AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna make that joke, and you fucking robbed me of that. God, joke. you got him by a tenth of a Son second of a on bitch. that, and I love it. Um, <laughs> just, just for the, I'm sure the listeners know, but in order to fully appreciate that, you have to a know what the Brady bunch was. <laughs> Is yeah. not a given in today's society. <laughs> yeah. B, you have to know that Robert Reed, the actor who played yeah. Mike Brady, the father, died of AIDS. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He he was disgusted every time he had to um, uh, kiss Florence Henderson, who played Carol Brady. Yeah, and you could tell too. Yeah, I knew it in every scene. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, there just wasn't enough passion there. Wasn't enough yeah, it was passion. Just like a peck. Yeah, and then he would always look over at Peter. You know, yeah. like while he was pecking her, he was looking over at Peter, uh, yeah. pecking to look at Peter, but. Uh, yeah, I, look, as a parent of two children, I've I've seen it a little differently, right? Because my, my kids were in school and then they were out of school and then they were on Zoom, right? I, I think me personally, as a parent, I saw some regression in what they were doing mm. versus when they were actually with other kids. Now, the two-year-old, you'd be like, what the fuck did, what's the difference there with a the two-year-old? It was the socialization because mm. he's two and a half. He was in preschool. He was with other, you know, two and a half year olds in this preschool. And he was learning to do different things. And then when he got home, when it, when it was, you know, canceled or, or whatever you want to call it uh, for the pandemic or scaled, scaled down, whatever right. sweet keyword they use, um, we saw some regression. Same thing with my six-year-old. We saw some regression where, you know, he was reading at a different level and all that yeah. other stuff. And uh, uh, Well, there's no competition. And it's also an analog for us not being able to have conversations with one another. Correct. Like, like if we're going to offend each other, that ends the conversation, so people just step away. Conflict resolution, learning it at an early age and how to do it appropriately is one of the most important things you can learn yeah. as a human being. Yeah, and so, but I, I, look, I'm not saying 
kids should stay at home because obviously parents need to get to work. Parents need to do other things with their lives. But let's just admit school is what it is. It's a babysitting service. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not saying that's a bad or good thing. That's actually a great thing. Mm. But don't try to stuff them full of like, well, here's the periodic table of elements. You have to remember that also. Yeah, yeah. And I agree. like, just say, hey, it's it, we're going to teach you to be healthy and 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 you're going to have friends and we're going to avoid bullying or whatever if we can mm. and learn what you want. Because I can't remember a single thing from first grade on unless I was interested in it. Right. Like, it's not like I can write cursive anymore or it's not like <laughs> you could tell. Uh, like, I don't know who the 14th vice president of the United States was, although we learned it at some point. I don't know how to, you know, cut up a frog. Who cares? Or, or, or what does F equals M A in physics or whatever? Anyway, the point is, most of these you only remember what you love doing anyway. So f- help people try different things and learn right. the things they love, even as a kid, and then they're going to learn the most anyway. Well, one of the so most just, important just, things I, you learn as a kid, one is is how to be social, right? The other one is how to think and not what to think, like the Socratic method, for example. If you teach kids how to uh, how to apply criticism and the Socratic method, uh, then they can learn anything the fuck they want. There's no, there's the sky's the limit at that point. Now there may be some more complex ideas that they need to be walked through at some point, mm-hmm. but for the most part, most people don't need to understand physics. You know what I mean? Correct. There's, or chemistry even. There's yeah. just no point to that shit. Why are we right? And you, and you don't remember, like, also even geometry. Mm. Like, can anyone, you know, maybe the brain here can? <laughs> uh, can you tell me how to find the volume of a cylinder? Uh, I can't do it. You just <laughs> multiply the all three by each other. Right. That's a that's a cube. Uh, but, of yeah. a cylinder. cylinder. Well, you have to use pi. You got to you got yeah. to throw some pi in there yeah. somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I know it's it's three point one four somewhere in there, but uh, it's an estimation. It. Yeah, yeah, essentially, because uh, it just keeps going yeah. on forever. Whatever. Um, how are your kids doing then? And and what do you say to them mm. about their lives going forward? Do you sit down with them and say, all right, what do you guys want to do? And let's kind of veer you towards that path in life. Um, because a lot of kids don't know what they want to do. So therefore school at least opens up your eyes to different subjects and jobs or potential jobs or interests that you might not have. So I look back at school, me personally and say, all right, I didn't like a lot of the, the shit that I was learning. However, I didn't know that I didn't like that shit until I at least tried it and then went on to something that I, I did enjoy. How are you handling that as a father then? Yeah. So, so I always think start first with you know assuming everything's healthy and yes the socialization is very important assuming that that all stays you know good or or wherever it was what do they love doing because now also is a chance to to fit really spend some time figure out what you what do you love doing and what would you like to pursue and then i will help you know and they're a little older they're like between the ages of 18 and 22 and i always help facilitate how can you do more i i've switched careers a lot and i've had to start from scratch learning new skills and then and then monetizing those skills and I, actually that's what my last book was uh called skip the line mm-hmm. everyone tell like if you're 45 and you want to suddenly switch from being an accountant to a sports writer everyone will say particularly the sports writers like you can't do that you can't just skip the line you got to pay your dues like the mm-hmm. rest of us you got to spend tw- 10,000 hours or 20 years or whatever to get good at this and and understand it and that's just BS. Like I know you can switch careers many times. I've seen people do it. I've done it. And so I always encourage them, find out what skills you want to be in the top 1% of. Not the top 10 in the world, but the top 1% in the world. That's good enough to monetize. And then do a combination of learning the skills and learning the industry. So like, say you want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, People think you could teach entrepreneurship in school. You, you can't. And an entrepreneur, there's no such skill as business or entrepreneurship. It's a com- it's like a basket of micro skills. You have to learn how to have ideas, how to execute on them, how to sell things, how to do marketing, how to manage people, how to sell your company. You know, there's lots of mini skills. Comedy, you guys deal, or, or do a lot of stuff with comedy. There's there, it's a it, there's no skill like oh I'm good at comedy. There's uh, crowd work, there's stage work, mm-hmm. there's humor, there's one-liners, there's storytelling, there's wor- working with the mic, there's making impressions, there's absurdity. There's all, uh, it's a basket of micro skills. So these are things that school doesn't even tell us about skill development. And I encourage my kids like, okay, you're interested in race car driving. Tell me the skills you need to learn. And now you have to tell me also the field, like, do you need a license? Where do you get one? How do we get you one? 
what's the difference between a NASCAR race and other kinds of races? And so I encourage them to both learn the skills and I figure out, I help them figure out what's the fastest way they could be in the top 1% in the world at whatever skill they want to pursue. And then at, simultaneously, you have to be, you have to really learn the field and master the, the field. So if someone wants to make a documentary and everyone says, you're, you're just a marketing guy at Procter & Gamble, you can't do a documentary. Well, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Here's how you learn those skills. And then here's how you understand how to be in the top 1% in the world uh, uh, in terms of monetizing those skills. All of these things are doable, and that's how kids should should think, and that's how I encourage. So we just got back from a weekend where our kid was taking, got her race car driving license and participated in her first race. She's 19 and didn't go to college. You know, Maybe she'll go next year. But I encouraged her to spend this year learning new fun skills that she loves. What, was it like Danica Patrick? What was she racing? Like a stock car? Or yeah, Andy stock car or Formula Rally One? Car. It, it was it was like a formula car. Hmm. Oh wow. shit! That's um, yeah, dope. she well, was going she was going over like two hundred miles an hour, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. and I was scared. I was nervous. <laughs> God <laughs> damn! You I also you, died you gotta have money myself. too to get into that field. Yeah. Um, since you are a, a serial entrepreneur, um, I, one would say like you've made a lot of money. You've also lost millions and millions of dollars. Um, yeah. Tell the Thanks audience. For reminding me. <laughs> well, look, I, I think it's important because I, I don't know how to describe you to the audience. You've done so much crazy shit in your life. In the entrepreneurial world, what was your biggest hits and what was your biggest losses? Yeah, I mean, I guess the biggest hit is always the first one. Like when you first, like I was dead, I grew up broke. Mm -hmm. I was dead broke uh, when I, you know, left school and, and moved, uh, got my first job in New York City. And I, I couldn't afford to, to live here. It was a whole thing. And um, no one could afford to live here when they first moved here. No. And I didn't have any family helping me or anything like that. And uh, But I, I did start a business that um, it was in the mid-90s and, and companies didn't have websites yet. And there was like maybe five people in New York City who knew how to build a website. And I happened to be fortunate and that I was one of them. And so just while I was at work at my full-time job, I would build webs. I built like America, American Express dot com from my my cubicle right. at my first full time. But job. you also built like and, death row records you know, and shit. I was making like thirty two thousand a year at my job, and then American Express dot com paid me two hundred fifty thousand yeah. to build their website. And suddenly my life changed. And so I built up a company. I hired people. I specialized in building the websites for entertainment companies because mm -hmm. my, my first big job was at HBO and I built their website and so on. And then I built websites for all these like gangster rap labels and music, other music labels. Uh, um, and then I sold it and I made millions of dollars. And I'm like, oh my God, I must be a genius. And so I started investing thinking, oh, I, I don't want it just 15 million. I want a hundred million. <laughs> and so I started investing like, millions of dollars in all these really crappy businesses. And I essentially lost every dime. Like I went from 15 million in the checking account to $143 in the checking account in one summer. Mm. And Holy shit. I, I was so depressed. I mean, of course, I was very fortunate and blessed to have made the money, but you know, I just, it's not like I spent it on anything. I invested all of it and lost it all very quickly. And I, I was so depressed. I thought I had won. I realized, oh my gosh, I'm actually an idiot. I had won the lottery. I'm never going to do that again. And now I'm dead broke. And once you get a taste of that independent life, also, you don't want to work in a cubicle again. And so I was really depressed. It took me a long time to, I had to, I had to leave the city and, and live super cheap. And then after living, after having that much kind of money, and I had to learn what it meant the, the meta skills for bouncing back, for, for learning a new industry and bouncing back. And then I made money again and then I lost all of that because there's three skills to money. There's there's making it, keeping it, growing it. Mm -hmm. So I seem to have, I realized I could make it, but I couldn't keep it and forget about growing it. <laughs> and, uh, and this happened to me like four times and it was finally I'm asking myself like, what am I doing wrong? all the time and and i just felt really bad i mean i was depressed for years because of all this like looking back on it and and it's it never gets easy like and you and it's almost like some kind of post trauma that you when you go broke like that it's it's like you think your life's set and then it's just you got to work harder than ever now over and over yeah um but yeah that's again my my book skip the line is is about this which is basically from scratch and, and with little money 
and with no network and with and no experience, how can you again pick something you love or a new industry to, to specialize in, become in the top one percent, and then and then separately, how do you make money now? Like, you know, can you make if you were a lawyer your whole life and now you want to be a chef, how do you learn? To how right. to be a chef and then and then monetize of, it yeah yeah and then make money because yeah. you gotta you, who wants to make money doing something they hate you want to do something you guys do stuff you love like right. th this is everybody should be able to and it's when i started focusing on that that then i started making you know good amount of money and i wasn't that eager to build more i was just more eager to do, keep doing what i love doing right and, and look even I switched at one point to stand-up comedy. I did stand-up comedy for like six or seven years. I still do stand-up comedy. And uh, it's very difficult to make money, as you know, doing stand-up comedy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but I just remember when I started it, all the comedians were saying to me, and not everybody, I should say many were supportive, but some would say to me, like right before I was going to go on stage, some people would come up to me and say, look, man, you can't skip the line. You got to do open mics, then yeah, check spot, yeah. then um, be an MC, and then hang out at the bigger clubs, get to know the bookers. And and then and then you have books that say, that say well, you need 10,000 hours to get good at something. And I'm like, this is all bullshit. Like, <laughs> I could do whatever I want. No one's my boss. And so I, you know, I, I would do what anybody would do when they want to get really good at something very fast and figure out how to monetize it. I've done right. that with everything from being a hedge fund manager to being starting a business to uh, podcasting to writing. I've tried to figure out the skills I've needed and then and then the, I tried to learn enough about the field so I could monetize it. And sometimes I failed and sometimes I did. I did well. At, well, at I mean, that. overall, you've done pretty well. And it's it's all this stuff you're talking about is super interesting. You're like the the poster child for a new creator economy, which is hopefully where we're going. I mean, the, the bigger the bigger the creator economy gets, the less power centralized ec economies have, right? Yeah. And that's the centralized power right now is a big fucking problem, not only just with first like freedom of speech and shit like that, but just with the economic disempowerment of everybody else that's mm -hmm. been going yeah, on and for I, years. I think the key is actually is to completely ignore the news and the government because the, the news is basically how the government tells you that you're not allowed to do things and mm, i'm not yeah. saying break the law or anything but just forgetting all the news there is there are so many opportunities and and opportunities and industries kind of mate with each other they have sex with each other and and they have baby industries that develop too that are fresh for entrepreneurship right and w the thing is it works the same way as Popular, you know, the population growth mm -hmm. is that, you know, two parents have more than two kids, and so the population mm -hmm. grows. Like you would never think that garbage collection and Silicon Valley would merge to for to ha would have sex together to form an industry. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the fastest growing industries right now is e waste. So like I can go to let's say I go to a company and I say, look, if if anybody breaks, if you throw out computers it's very easy for me to find out where you throw your computers and I could take that computer, take it apart and read all your data that, right, yeah. and by the way, that's against the law for you, the mm -hmm. company. And so what if I, what if I were to just dispose of all your computers and I, and I can verify to you that I'm doing it in a legal regulated way. It would, it would cost you a lot of money to dispose it on and clean these things on your own. So this is an industry that I take the, they're like, okay, what does it cost us? No problem. It's free. I'll do it for you for free because then I clean the computers and resell them yeah. um, on eBay for thousands of dollars. Now I don't do that, right? I just actually someone was just telling me they're in that business today. Sure, but uh, but they're making millions, and they just the industry just started like yesterday. Yeah, it, it's a weird thing. And, and real quick to circle back to your your stand up thing, the the most depressing doc of stand up you can watch is ironically Jerry Seinfeld's. By the way, um, if you go and pop that on. He was, even after Seinfeld, he was still doing stand-up every single night, and he was getting on his own private jet, doing shows in New York, and then flying to Cleveland, so he could beat, uh, you know, the, the next thing, and then going to LA, so it would be the three-hour difference, so he could get on later at night. It was the most depressing shit of all time. I mean, that's so. like Jordan sitting in his, if you, in the last dance, he's sitting in that big room where the interview happened, it's just TVs in front of him, yeah. where he's watching basketball happen. Yep. Yeah. I mean, look. Yeah, clearly these dudes did what they loved for a long time, but became uh, uh, pathological about it in some way, right? Right. Like just, I mean, I, I think I was lives. becoming 
I mean, that's where I, I was going with this. Yeah. yeah, is is that is that the same kind of thing for you, or is that why yeah, you I mean, switched I was fields doing so many times? Five nights a week, and mm. and then I was traveling to Cleveland, Cincinnati. Uh, I went all over the Netherlands. I was traveling with um, Tony Woods, who's like mm. a legendary comedian. Tony Woods is hilarious. And, and I it's fucking just, love Tony's that guy. Tony's just brilliant. Yeah. And I had gigs coming up in Kansas City, and again in Cincinnati, and in Tampa Bay, and I realized, you know what? I don't know if I want to spend four days traveling, getting on a plane, getting in a hotel, going to going to the stage, hearing the comedy club owner tell me what the rules are, and and then trying to impress a bunch of stra- you know twenty strangers yeah, yeah. that hey look at me I'm funny <laughs> and I could just do that from home and make you know make my friends laugh and do maybe yeah. local comedy but. I, comedy, I realized, was a means to an end rather than the end itself. Right. But is that why you kept switching jobs? Is it because you were trying to stay interested in what you were doing? Or was it, is it more just about life at this point of like, how many things can you possibly do that are interesting that keep your mind yeah. occupied well, or you, fulfilled? You, you, or... You, seem, you seem a lot like me. You seem dispassionate about the, the process itself and more interested, or not dispassionate about the outcome in a lot of ways and more, like you said before, you don't really care where you live. And I agree, I've, I feel the same. I don't really give a shit where I am. Yeah. Like I feel the same all the time and it, I've never really, like I've been happier in some jobs than others. Obviously owning all this is much better than not owning your own shit, mm-hmm. for sure, being able to set my own hours. But I'd be having a good time regardless. So. If that's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't yeah. know if I was totally dispassionate because when I went broke and every, every time I went broke, I really wanted to make my money back because I had no way to support my, my family Correct, and, yeah. and I had just gone from millions to zero. So it feels really depressing. So, but I think I focused for too long on, on money and I would get really depressed and, and anxious. And finally I was just like, man, I just got to stop pleasing everybody to try to make money. Mm. And I just started writing my own stuff and the only things I was interested in. And that ended up, you know, building a much larger audience. And, and, and I really am convinced you can make money doing, or at least build your network that can make money Mm. uh, doing, doing anything. But for me, it was more like I would completely bomb and I would make a lot of money in some area. Then I completely bomb at it. And then, uh, uh, or I would change interests and I would be so passionate about what new thing I was interested in. I would become not interested in the old things and obsessively pursue it and using these techniques that I just, that I just wrote about in this, in this book that came out. So, um, well, t- say you know, the like, name of the book so our guys can buy it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, it's called skip the line. Skip I didn't want to seem line. like I was overly no, marketing that always the book, no, we, we yeah. look, we, we don't give a shit at all. Yeah. And, and that's, <laughs> that's the gig of podcasts, right? Um, but you were also a best selling author author from uh, choose yourself. Yeah. Choose yourself. Yeah. Which, book. which is in a similar vein, which is that, Everyone will tell you, like, uh, oh, you need to, let's say you want to write a book. Well, you need an agent. Then you need yeah. an editor to like your book. Then the editor has to convince the marketing department mm-hmm. and the publisher. And then they have to convince the book buyers and, and, and so on. And that's all BS. So I, with Choose Yourself, that was like my 10th book. I had published many books before then with regular publishers. I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this book. I'm going to write the book I want. And then when I'm done with it, I'm going to upload it to Amazon. Mm-hmm. No one ever asks me, hey, who published that? No one gives a shit. Yeah, People think yeah. that you can't be a writer unless you have a publisher. Well, only no, other you writers. can just upload your book to Amazon. And I hired a, I hired someone to do a cover for like $1,500. I didn't use one of the, uh, they give you templates you can use. I didn't yep. use one of those. And I, I got someone to help me with the marketing. I had no idea how to market on my own the book. And I, I, I got a friend to, to edit it and another friend to edit it. You need a bunch of editors. Yeah. And I had a high quality book published, sell, just uploaded to Amazon, hit publish. So now I published it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it was the next week, it was on the Wall Street Journal bestseller That's list awesome. and the USA Today bestseller list. New York Times, it would have been, but they didn't that's put a, on the bestseller that's a, that's list. A curated, that's a curated list. We've been through yeah, this before. I, I've, yeah, I've, I've, I've been on there before, and uh, look, my you can pay to get it on there too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you used to be able to. I heard they they nuke that um, with barcodes and all that stuff. But you know, for example, and we tell the audience this all the time. Like, um, I wrote a, a, a book with uh, one of my best friends, who was a, yeah, a former best. co-host, yeah. and um, it was number one. We, you know, Publishers Weekly was, it was number one in the world, right? What's, a, what's the book called? Uh, Thank You For My Service is yeah. the name of it. Oh, so he's a former, oh my God. Yeah. I've, I've 
totally seen that. I'm, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna buy it right now. Yeah, so yeah. it was. Uh, look, it spent nine weeks on the New York Times. Uh, New York Times bestseller. But it but peaked at five, right? It peaked at five, but it was number one. So we were number one in Wall Street Journal, number one in USA Today, number one in, in the publishers. I believe for three weeks. Weekly, yeah, and it. But becoming, we had the most number numbers, but the New York Times is curated, so they can yeah. put whatever numbers they want there. And no one understands that. Yeah. Um, and they hate self-publishers, by the way. So if you self-publish, yes. they will not put you on the New York Times bestseller list or right. they'll do everything to deter it oh, yeah. because they make more money off the publishers and, yeah, and sure. they've got yeah. some side deals going on. Yeah. Um, how did yeah. you do it with an independent book? Because I'm looking at your, I'm looking at uh, Choose Yourself. It was Create Space, which is, was the very first version of uh, self uploading yeah, yeah, yeah. Self for self-publishing. Self -publish, yeah. um, what was the what was the reaction you know from people like did they start calling other publishers start calling did agents start calling and try yes, to figure out who yes. you are yes in fact every publisher and agent that had ever rejected me before all called me oh, <laughs> and, that's so funny. Um, and i don't even say that cynically like some agents and editors re realized i existed after that even though i had published with harper collins before right. with penguin before with other publishers but like um, you know, one editor who I had worked with in the past um, wanted to work with me again. And then one publisher said, hey, we'll republish Choose Yourself professionally. And I'm like, well, I did it professionally. It just, <laughs> I <laughs> uploaded it instead of you do. And, 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 and they said, but we'll give you an advance. And I'm like, okay, well, tell me what I have to do. And they said, well, you have to unpublish your book for about a year and then we'll publish it. And I'm Whoa. like, well, why would I, my book is selling, I'm making money every day on yeah, my book. Yeah, yeah. Like, it sold a million copies. Like, why do I need to re unpublish it for a year? And they said, so you would get then officially published by, you know, whoever it was. I think it was Simon and Schuster. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, what else are you going to do for me other than make me unpublish my book? <laughs> and they're like, well, that's it. We're, we're, we're Simon and Schuster. We'll get it in the bookstores. And I'm like, but I'm already selling more books than I've sold with any yeah. traditionally published book in the past. And so I ultimately I said no to them. Yeah. But I, I, my last book, Skip the Line, I published with Harper Collins again, just because I wanted to see how things have changed. And mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's never good to stay religious about one thing. And no, it's been no. a good experience uh, working with them. Definitely, I'll not. probably self-publish. I mean, then and then this next book. So I published a book like two weeks ago called Skip the Line, mm -hmm. and I have a book coming out kind of coincidentally in a week, or actually this week. What day is it today? Uh, like the thirtieth today. Oh, yeah, it's coming out Tuesday. tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so Charlemagne the God, who's the radio host, mm -hmm. uh, uh, he and I wrote a book about, or he and I made an audio book, I should say, about uh, racism. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened was, do you remember he did that interview with Joe Biden? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, and Joe Biden, he, Charlemagne said, Joe Biden needed to leave. And Charlemagne said, hey, we have questions. And Joe Biden's like, well, if you ain't decided between Trump and me by now, then you ain't black. Right. And he, Biden had to apologize for that and so on. But I wrote Charlemagne and I said, that line you said, we have questions, is like an iconic line. Like that mm. sounds like a book to, a book title, like a best-selling book title. It sounds and, like a series of books, you, actually. for you, if you really have questions, let's get them out there so that mm. everybody in the country can hear your questions and, and hear the answers. And he's like, this is great. Um, can you help me with it? And I'm like, well, you should do it. I don't want to be involved in it at all. I'm just giving you a, an idea. And so I wrote, like I outlined it. I did some research. I kind of fleshed out the outline mm. a bit. And... He and Charlemagne and his team was like, oh, please, let's let's do it together. You be the guy who uh, he says, I'll find the people you should interview. You be the person who interviews. And I'm like, nah, nah, I don't want to do it. And, you know, to be honest, even um, someone high up in the book industry told me you shouldn't do it because maybe you'll be like the white, you know, white savior. People. Yeah, that whole yeah. trope. And yeah. and and um, but I want I kind of wanted to do it and I liked working on it. So ultimately I did do it. But this is how things get done. Like. I shared ideas that I had with someone I vaguely knew. I knew mm. him a little bit. He had been on my podcast for one of his books. And um, I, I, you always want to share your best ideas with people because you shouldn't feel like, you should feel abundant in ideas, not like this is my one shot. Right. And so I shared the idea with him. And this is how things happen sometimes. Like, because I had some ideas and I thought about someone other than myself, I thought about something that would be good for this guy Charlemagne. I now out of it's like out of like our minds this audiobook is coming out he organized all the people i interviewed like 15 different you know you know african american intellectuals celebrities whatever who and, were they um like uh david banner for instance the rapper oh shit he's uh, great uh 
Eric Adams, who not only is the Brooklyn Borough President, but mm. he's running for he's 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 in in the in mayor the race, thick, so. running for mayor of New York yeah. City. Mm. I mean, it's not and, gonna it's not gonna be the guy there now. Right? No, <laughs> Let's be real no. about that. Yeah, De Blasio. I mean, out of there. Andrew Yang is probably uh, you know he's looking pretty probably good. Probably gonna win, but yeah. um, you know Eric's a really good guy, mm. and, and it was a bunch of people like like that, and it's. And lo and behold, this is coming out tomorrow. Audible's doing a lot of promotion, and it's going to be, I don't know if there's a bestseller list for audio books, there but is. it'll, be, it'll there be, is. be up there. Yep, so they, they, New York Times just started a bestseller list for audio books. It started uh, about two years ago um, because they're massive. Um, everybody who's listening to podcasts, the, the biggest complaint we get out of our podcasts, um, out of all of our network, is I wish they were longer, right? Well, Dan and I specifically don't do more than an hour and a half or two hours just because I, I we we feel that that's too much to to yeah. ask an audience to sit down for three hours on something is i mean it depends on the subject it yeah. depends on how much editing you're doing if you're going to go through and clip everything out that that are like rogan does if you're mm -hmm. going to do that then it works fine but yeah if, if you do it like we do just straight up long form content here you go do what you want with it then it, it, it does become a little bit tedious i think yeah so so with me here's where i noticed it first um was i had my first book was called at night she cries while he rides his steed it was a, a, a spoof of um, romance, novel, yeah. romance novels for women. And I, I wrote this series of romance novels for dudes. But it's from the perspective. Oh, my God. That's a great idea. Yes. Wait, and it, so the it's title from, again? at night she cries while he rides his steed. <laughs> and, and it's from the perspective of a total dirtbag dude, too, by the way. Because it's that's how it is with like the female romance novels. She's it's always the same trope, like some pent up housewife or some. Yes. Some weird ass fantasy. And this yep. is just like. If you take that fantasy, you reverse it to a dude and just make him a dirtbag. Yep. It's pretty much what it is. It's fucking hilarious. And it was Simon and Schuster, but um, because I didn't have that big of a social media mm. presence uh, or hardly any at that time, Jared Taylor was the one who convinced me actually to, to start uh, social media. Yeah. Um, once once uh, I did the audiobook, I hired actors for it, and the audiobook exploded. Yeah, and no one had ever done it before like that. To have actual actors reading all the individual voices in an audiobook is the first time. And you have done. unbelievable five star ratings. This is a Correct. four point eight out of five. Yeah, like, I, I look, but but I have you know I, I've I've done four books now. And everybody says the same thing of like, holy shit, you have the highest ratings on Audible because we did it differently. And then even with Matt, like I told him, I was like, look, you've got to read your own book. People want to hear you and they want yeah. to hear your voice, not the British guy. It was a, a very long fight with Simon and Schuster and it came down to the nth hour. And uh, I, I was very adamant about reading my own book with these actors and everything else. And they, they said, yes, finally. Um, so I did it and I put it out. That's what helped Ex explode the hardbacks and yeah, paperbacks and ebooks. It was the audiobooks first. Well, now they're going in reverse, Dan. So now they're giving these audio deals huge money uh, from mm -hmm. out of Audible, and they're saying, "Great, we don't really care about the book." Yeah, because we want to hear it. The the it's it's the same thing that happened in uh, in in social media before, right? So social media was consumed, by, uh, I think, in 2014, 90 percent on a desktop, 10 percent on mobile. It's flipped. Yes. There. Yep. Same thing has happened with uh, media consumption, right? Mm -hmm. In general, now it's I, all. I agree, phone. and I agree with the point too of you got to read your own book because people want to get to know you. They mm -hmm. don't want to hear. Yeah, for sure. Have you listened to? Have you listened but to? But by Green the way, Light you know, yet? we uh, uh, when I said a friend of mine edited Choose Yourself, you know him. I just see on on the thank thank you for my service. It was it Nils? Uh, Niels Parker was oh, my yeah. Nils editor is, on Choose yeah. Yourself. Yeah. He's he's uh, one of the very best editors in the entire world. Um, well, that's the thing is too is that the be not every not it's this is not a truism, but often the best vet editors are not employees of a company. They're correct, able to, right? You know, now some people like working and being an editor in in the publishing industry, and there are some great editors there. But Niels is a, a truly fantastic editor who is able to generate business on his own and doesn't need to work for you know Simon and Schuster or whatever. Yeah, uh, like they might hire him, but uh, to 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 do independent stuff, right. but. He we hired him independently of the yeah. yeah we hired him uh independently of like the 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 publisher was uh penguin on that one mm -hmm. um we hired him independently of of penguin on that because we felt he was just the best for the job right, right. So like like he was the guy uh and you're right he's so talented that he doesn't really need them um it's vice versa like because that you but know I, as an like an editor that's a fucking hard job oof, especially to find a good one man and, and he's one of the very best yeah, for sure. he will endlessly work so for good. the rest of his life and uh on that yeah on that audiobook thing have you read uh green lights yet have you you uh Matthew oh yeah McConaughey's, Ma McConaughey's no i bought it but i haven't i haven't read it yet well, I, I know it's good people tell me it's really good great it's audio great. book it's, it's great but when, once you're done with it come back on the show we can discuss some more of this in other books right. as well but uh once you're done with it imagine 
having listened to the whole thing in somebody else's voice other than Matthew McConaughey. You can't. I, I listened yeah. to the whole thing and I, that's the first thing I thought. I was like, I would not have listened to this. I would have read it mm -hmm. probably had it been somebody else's voice just because I want to hear his voice in my head. Like right. I, would, I would have read it and imagined him reading it instead of doing that. Like no shit. Yeah. And, and also with the, the thing with the audio book is, and some publishers don't like this, but I, I like doing this, which is, I feel the audiobook is just a different product. So I'll read, you know, basically the content of the book, but I'll riff and tell stories. And, you know, sometimes in the moment you think of new things or you think of ideas or or you just want to add a little color to something. And Didn't you I guys think the have audiobook to do that? is made for yep. the, the, the modern writer. Yeah, I it think is. On, yes. on thank you for my service, I'm pretty sure it's some, there were some tangents in the reading and you had to go back and adjust the, the book version of that after yes the fact, and, right? and, and the books so yeah. whenever i write my books um i will I, I won't i'll save the final edit until after we do the audio book because yeah. dan was in the last one and mm -hmm. um uh that way when you're reading it if it sounds wonky you know uh read out loud yeah. we'll just change the lines and then i'll mark it and then yeah. i'll go back in there and change it and, and that that will be my final edit and sometimes versus, you fuck up and it's funnier than the one before correct right? yeah and so i'll go back yeah. and change my edit based on the audiobook not based on all right well we've got to go word for word for yeah. what, i never what's actually thought about that but that's a really good point james I, I honestly you couldn't do that if it was somebody else reading it yes and, and the other right. part why, why i asked you to do it um was because there was certain historical things in there mm. that i know you would knew and I, I know you would know and then you, you you would go back and change it and be like no it would have been like this and you would tweak yeah, yeah. a line and then i went back into the book and changed it and you're able to do that now in this new world of audiobooks mm. where before you, you just weren't whatever was you know in the fucking hardback that again, was it we're and, talking about creator economy here right we're yes talking about in this in this time it's not just a single individual doing something it is a small group of people doing something and everybody's getting their own input in without outside interference and what you get is the best possible product in my opinion yes absolutely yeah. absolutely and you know that's and again first off every thing you do every activity is 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 best when you think of it as a team mm -hmm. like okay well i'm not the best marketer so who should i talk to i don't have to hire them but i should at least get advice from marketers editors uh people to, who's familiar with the publishing industry social media writing like even learning the skill of writing is mm -hmm. an you know an important skill it's maybe the most valuable skill in the creator economy is being able to tell a story yep. so all, all this stuff's important and you know i talk about in the book, I talk about how another thing you should do, and you could, and, and I've been doing this with writing a bit, is experiments. So if you experiment with like new or crazy ideas, like I love, you could view the idea of writing a romance novel from the man's perspective as an experiment in the romance genre. And once you do that, A, you're the first who, who does it, so it yep. becomes a bestseller, yeah. and B, if it, the experiment works, it's like you've just created a genre. And mm. the downside is you did something funny and weird and, and you have a story to tell about yeah. it. And, that, and there's no real downside to no. doing something experimental. And, and so, the, you know what the biggest upside of that was? was uh, there was a romance novel convention in New York City that they sent me to, oh. sent me to, to do promos for. Was you for. the only dude there? I was the only <laughs> dude there and every oh. woman flipped out and I, I got to read a segment of the book. All those books are written kind of like Airplane or Blazing Saddles, mm -hmm. um, where it's just the yeah. most horrific comedy. Yeah. Uh, but it's super graphic sexual. I mean, there, in the second book, he is sex with Harriet Tubman. Well, the opening scene is a graphic sex scene <laughs> with Harriet Tubman. Yeah, and she's on the cover well, look, of she, it. She deserved it for all the good she did. Yes, it was great. Yeah. Exactly. It was great. She did have a good time. Yeah. It's unclear if she ever had a good time. Yeah, we've no documentation on that. Well, yeah. now, now we do in the form of your fiction, but. Yeah, yeah, but but every woman was laughing and having a good time and all that other shit. And there was like, fuck, 3,000 people there. And it was awesome. One of the things you were talking about is where it's like, hey, you can create your own genre. You can do all this other stuff. Um, but it takes a strong work ethic and you really have to work hard at it. Is that something you instill in your your children or? oh yeah absolutely like for instance my my daughter who is doing the race car driving mm -hmm. you know it's she's taken a bunch of a couple weeks worth of lessons and she got a race car driving license and i said to her don't think that makes you a race car driver like you need to every week if you if you really love this you need to every week pursue it watch videos listen to interviews read books uh uh you have to get a, what i call a plus minus equal get a coach get equal who, who teaches you and watches your videos and, and gives you feedback. You need equals who are your peers who you exchange ideas with and you need minus, meaning if you can't explain something to someone else, then you haven't really understood it. And so, you know, get the plus minus equals, break apart the micro skills and figure out how you can study them, you know, isolate them and study them. 
Uh, and there's a whole list of things that, that I told her to do. Otherwise, if you just want to have something on your resume that's kind of cool, then, then don't ever do this again because you're, you're done. You did it. Yeah. But if you want to actually do something more, like no one could tell the difference between, you know, someone who's been in 100. This is like about stand-up comedy too. A lot of people outside of the comedy world are really impressed. Like, oh, you do, you've done stand-up comedy or you do stand-up comedy? The answer is yes. And so you don't need to have a Netflix special to say, for se- yeah, for a bunch of years, I performed a bunch of times. And I, I, if you could even just say, yeah, once a year I went mm-hmm. up on stage and that's good enough for, for if you want if you want to do that skill for ancillary reasons, like, oh, you want to impress people or right, yeah, yeah. you want to have a cool factor or you want to get a job because you did this. Like, I at, when I was a kid, I was, um, uh, or I, yeah, I was, is a good way to say it. I was a chess master and I was New Jersey's, uh, I was the highest ranked kid in New Jersey and blah, blah, blah. And... I met a cab driver the other day who was uh, the champion of Turkey before he moved here. And he was in chess, I he was in chess. And, Not uh, of cab driving. and, and <laughs> he told me he plays chess. And I'm like, I figured, OK, he's like an amateur player. It's cute. Mm. And he said, oh, yeah, I was the champion of Turkey. And, and then we ex- so then I knew he was serious and we exchanged our rankings mm-hmm. and he was much stronger than me. And yet I've, you know, because of my chess skills, I got. I skipped a line. I got into college. I got right. into grad school. I got into, I raised money for a business. I got hired for my first job. Like there's so many ancillary benefits to doing certain activities that you just have to decide where you get the benefit from, how right. much you need to, no well, one can tell the difference between me and the champion of yeah, Turkey yeah. unless you're a professional player. Did you play him? But Did you get out of the fucking cab and say, look, we're playing right now. Let's go. Did you? He, on, he would win on the hood of the car. Oh, he. So, so you just assumed he would win based on rankings, and you were like, "I'm not going to play you." Yeah, it's all done statistically. Well, he wouldn't automatically win. He would win two out of three times against me. And um, so, <laughs> how do you so, know that? And, hmm? How do you know that? Because it's all every time you play in a tournament, you get statistically adjusted, and the statistics is pretty accurate because you play hundreds or thousands of times. Mm. The statistics of, about what your ability is is unless you're moving up fast or moving down fast, you're, the statistics are accurate and and it's all done with on a statistical Algorithm, bell yeah. curve. Yeah, and yeah. he's one standard deviation higher than me, so that means he would win two out of three times. That's that's no great. So, shit. You know what you're describing to me with these? Uh, I don't know what you would even call them, these little ventures into different kind of things. It's almost like a. a a new age or virtual golf course. All the deals used to get made on the golf course, regardless of your talent in the in the office. Mm-hmm. If you had buddies on the golf course where you could just exchange simple ideas with one another, you were able to make far more progress than anybody else, right? Yeah. And now, yeah, no, now you're right. That's kind of a skip the line approach. Yeah, is getting is. good at golf yeah. so that you could then make great. I, I'll, I'll tell you, if you're great at golf, you will make a better network on the golf yeah. course because everyone who goes, all the businessmen who play golf, would love to be better. And yep. if you're the best. That's status. I wonder. So like, I it, wonder if the there's same thing with uh, chess, for instance. Like people assume chess players are smart. It's right. not true at all. And but it doesn't <laughs> well, matter. Like chess. being good at chess has really helped me. So right. you, you figure out the things that help you. Being good at stand-up comedy will help people. Yeah, for sure. I mean, being good at, at just political commentary in general, and that's uh, yeah. It's it's not all political and stand-up, but it kind of is, right? And we're talking about life, pretty much yeah, on stage. Writing a book well, is is a uh, is a status thing. So, I mean, I, I happen to love writing. I'm assuming you love writing, but people who just do it like, hey, I wrote a book, that gets them almost as much benefit as it does the people who love writing. It might even get them more benefit if they understand the field better than the, than the, the great writers who are right. writing like the most literary fiction or yeah. whatever. So now you're unpacking so. like secrets to success. If I wanna, I love doing X and, to, and most of the people who love doing X, most of the top 10%, which is where you're trying to get, also do this leisure activity or this recreational activity or they, they study this or they do that. Yeah. They travel here or whatever the fuck. You start doing those things, then you kind of skip the line and get yourself in, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, a really smart, that's a really smart observation. I like that. You know, and since in the past few months, I decided, okay, I'm going to use the techniques of my book and, and I'm going to get, you know, I haven't studied, I'll use chess as an example. I haven't studied chess in 30 years. That's when I was really playing in tournaments and was at my peak. And you, if you don't play golf, for instance, for a few months, you'll lose all your skills. <laughs> yeah. You have to play all the time. And so I said, okay, I'm going to use the techniques to be better than I ever was at chess and, and, and not, not only get as good as I was, but, but far better than I ever was. And in about three months, it, it took me, I'm definitely at the same rank as I was at my peak. And now I'm, I'm trying to get better. 
than than my peak. And what, and what are you like, hoping to do with it now? To, do, to be able to get good at his skill fast, but not so good that you waste your life. Like the guy who was the champion of Turkey, he had to spend an extra five years studying more than I had, and he was driving the cab. But, Nothing but, wrong with that, but it's just he didn't need to do that if it was for a career. Right. But out of curiosity, why try to get great at chess again? How does that benefit you today, you personally? Uh, it doesn't, actually, <laughs> in, really. But I did read that you know, after the TV show, The Queen's Gambit, 60 million people signed up for chess.com. 60 million. That is, that that is happened, true, by the way. The same That's thing true. happened when the World Series of Poker first went on to uh, ESPN. It was the R Rounders came out in 99. World mm -hmm. Series of Poker came on to ESPN in 2002, I think, for the first time. Oh, yeah. And then uh, 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 Texas Hold'em. That's the first time anybody ever even fucking heard of it. Now everyone's like, oh, I play Texas Hold'em on the weekends. Like, that's great. Rounders right. was so far ahead of its time. Right. Like, it was, really. That movie should have come out in like 2010, to be honest. But if there was no Rounders, there probably isn't the Maybe World not. Series of Poker. Maybe not. No, but, but you know what, though? I love those like subculture movies. Oh, like yeah. Rounders, The Queen's Gambit mm -hmm. is a great example. The Hustler, mm -hmm. The Color yeah. of Money. You know, and Walter Tevis wrote The Hustler, The Color of Money, and The Queen's Gambit. So it's interesting. And then I Brian Koppelman, who yeah. wrote hmm. Rounders, of course, is now doing the TV show Billions. Yep. I, I yep. noticed because I was show. an advisor on Billions for a while. Great show. And it's that sub that hedge fund subculture is a little bit grimier than people think. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's. You don't really, you, I mean, as a writer, that's pretty easy. You just kind of like listen to what people are saying about all the scumbags. Like, oh, shit, I can just write about this. I don't have to make anything up. Let's yeah. That's what he did. He'd go, there was a, a poker club that I used to play at in the 90s called the Mayfair. Brian and his writing partner, David Levine, uh, went every night to the Mayfair for like a year and then wrote a book about the experience and the Mayfair is the club where KGB uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, is hanging out yep. yes. is based on yes. that. I mean that's a great that ca so for a movie like that that was uh, like you said it's kind of a cult movie Malkovich is in it uh, uh, Matt Damon Matt Damon Ed Norton, Ed Norton. Uh, uh, John Turturro that's yeah. a serious situation going on there Look, yeah, it, it was a, again. It was ahead of its time, man, and, it, yeah. and it's it it kind of snowballed for that that whole poker community yeah. after that. Um, since you've had your fingers in so many different things, oh, slow it down. Oh, hands? Are we going with hands then? Yeah, uh, the full. Well, fist. I guess cancer, what? Uh, canceled for fingers then. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Hands? It's hard to say anymore, really. Since you've had your dirty little hands and fingers <laughs> in every single thing, what if you were to advise kids for the future? What what is the next hot? job prospect or field that they should go into that that people don't really know about necessarily right now well the answer is i don't know because that's almost by definition like i people make more bad predictions than good predictions even the mm -hmm. best predictors but what i can say is every day do like it's almost like you physically exercise the creativity muscle every day write 10 ideas so write 10 ideas down and that exercise, they could be bad ideas, they could be good ideas. Most of them are gonna be bad ideas because you can't write 3,650 good ideas a year. Write 10 ideas a day down and you'll start feeling like, oh my gosh, this is my creativity muscle. I feel, it's like I'm sweating in my brain. Like you'll start to connect new neurons and you'll realize what is the industry that is most compelling to you because that's where you'll start to drift in your ideas. You'll have the most ideas about that. So like for instance, the, the idea for the book with Charlemagne came out of, I've been doing this, these lists for years. I, I made a list that morning of here's the 10 chapters if Charlemagne were to write a book. Um, and I, I sent him the list and that created a book out of nothing. And you know, I, I sent the list once, here's 10 ways Amazon could be better. And Amazon wrote me back, you know, a, a guy from there wrote me back and said, hey, um, this is great. It, let us know if you're ever in Seattle and we'll, all, we'll, we'll you come up to Amazon, we'll all hang out. And I said, well, it just so happens I'm going to be in Seattle next week. I wasn't, I had never been to Seattle in my life. I was never going to Seattle in my life. But I, I bought a ticket to Seattle right when he said that. And I showed up and I got to see all the new products they were doing about publishing and self-publishing. And then you build a relationship with them. And I've been working with them ever since. And amazing things happen when you exercise your creativity every day. So that's the only real advice I would give is start writing 10 random mm. ideas a day down. I they like could that. be for businesses, books, they could be for clothes you would like to wear, they could be ideas for your friends uh, or whatever. What well, age see, What age would you start that at? Five. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I mean, that's the way to exercise your, if you don't exercise a muscle, it atrophies. Mm. Most people have an idea muscle or creativity muscle that's atrophied and you really learn um, a lot uh, if you start uh, if you start that young I mean I started that 
when I lost all my money, I was didn't know what to do next. And mm. I started writing down ideas every day on waiter's pads specifically because it's easy to bullet point and you can't write too much. You just have to go from idea to mm. idea. And it's really been uh, a phenomenal thing. Yeah, that's I, so again, we're all everything that you're talking about is comes back to creator economy, in my opinion, at least from what I'm hearing yes. from you. Mm. And I wonder, so let's. We, we all see this uh, constriction uh, from the government, from, from conglomerate business on American life, mm -hmm. right? They want to grind the most out of us uh, from the conglomerate side and but sell us the most shit. The government wants to take as much money and power as it can get, blah, blah, blah. It's just how things work, right? This seems to be the rebellion. The creator economy seems to be the rebellion against that. And, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, sorry, no. go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say, if that's the case, and, and please finish with your point, but if that's the case, how do we move that? How, how do we work backwards and train our kids in this next generation how to take advantage of that shit in a way that makes not only their lives better, but everyone's lives better, right? Because we live in a fucking country. We live in a world. If, if I'm doing well and you're not doing well, that makes me feel some kind of way, and it should. And if it doesn't, you're a fucking sociopath. So how do we teach our kids to take advantage of a creator economy, maintain their liberty and creativity, work with others well, and then take care of others well as well, if our education system is so hopelessly fucked right now? Well, I, I mean, this is such a great, I mean, this is a great overriding question about society right now, because clearly, if you're not allowed to teach, uh, you know, about gender differences or whatever in school, like something is com is is wronged forever in right. school. Like that's, there's an illness there and it's, and you don't, in this case, you don't try to cure the illness because government is too involved, but you just, you have to move away from it mm. and avoid it or ignore it. And and again, in the creator economy, you have to, you, you can't just create out of nothing. You have to teach yourself to be, creativity is a skill and you have to, and it's a muscle and you have to build it up like in that way I say with 10 ideas a day, but also you have to just know that nobody should tell you you can't do something. And everybody, everybody will tell you because they everybody's agenda is, I don't want, you know, James to change. I like him the way he was, or I don't want him to pass me in the area that I love doing. Like he, what he doesn't pay his dues. So everyone, no one has incentive to tell you, oh yeah, you're going to be great at this. You should definitely qu quit accounting and, mm. and move to Hollywood. Like no one is ever going to, to tell you that they're always going to say, yeah, you can't do that. And yeah, so you yeah. have to then uh, again, ignore, uh, ignore the people who tell you you can't. And then you have to experiment. Like don't change your life on a whim, you have to experiment. And, and cons a, a nature of an experiment is you have a theory that you want to test out. An experiment should be cheap yep. or, no, or free. Low risk. Ex experiment should take no time, not, not that much time, and you should learn from it. Right. Um, and you know, may, the upside is huge, but at the very least you should learn, yeah, this is something I enjoyed doing or this right. is something I didn't enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was starting to do stand-up, I went on a subway and started doing stand-up stand -up from car to car just to see if I could handle performing in front oh of a hostile God. audience. That sounds that I, like I'm, I'm sweating audience. just hearing that yeah. story because having I, done stand up for yeah. years and years, the last place I would do that is on and the fucking New, subway. And the subway in New York. Yeah, <laughs> on the L Yeah, train. no, I was scared to death. I was scared to death, but I, I had someone who was going to videotape it, and I said to her, ah, I "Don't, I'm not. Gonna, I wasted your time. I'm sorry. I'm, there's no way I'm going to do stand up." And then I said, "Oh, why don't you just turn on the camera and let's see what happens?" And then I just started performing and it wasn't great and it wasn't bad, but it got me to think a little bit more about how to tightly make my one liners and, and tell stories very quickly to get to the laugh and how to deal with an audience who doesn't give a shit about you. Yeah, that's yeah. really funny. I've, I just I had a good idea. Let's write a book called The Creator Economy and explain it from forward to backward, like what the creator economy is, what it's in response to and how to train people to engage in it. I feel sure. like we can get enough people together that have like we're we're new media and we're all self-created. Yes, uh, you've yeah. pretty much recreated yourself several times. Now I'm sure we could find some other people that have written before that would be interested in this because I think it's I we we have to do something to economically empower people. I I'm looking forward to reading uh, or listening to the audio book tomorrow with you and Charlemagne because I'm curious well, what everyone has to say. I personally think well, no, the, skip the line is the one I wrote about kind of the economic oh, yeah, yeah. Or, or the skill learning and learning your field. Yeah, and yeah. with Charlemagne, it, it's going to be interesting it's the, as well because it's about, you know, racism race. well, and no, BLM. Those, those two but things tie in together for me. I think that the only color that really matters in this country is green, right? Economic empowerment solves so many different issues. Uh, uh, that is, that, like the right, well, the right continues to refuse to admit that one to five trillion dollars was robbed out of the black community that 83% of all uh, money transfers from one generation to the next and all this other stuff, and that poverty is the number one predictor of crime, right? So these 
age old fucking stereotypes and prejudices are based in complete nonsense, right? Go to the fucking hill, the, the hollers in West Virginia and what, what are you going to find? Poor people that engage in organized crime more frequently than white people. people. Yeah. White people. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, no, I, I agree. And it, part of it is part of it is the educational system. And part of it is the fact that if you think about being a parent, like if you give some, if you give your kids everything in life, mm. they're going to turn out to be not, you know, they're, they're not going to be as self-sufficient as you would like them to be. Right. They're going to be shitbags. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. say it. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, yeah. that's what the guys but, in Calling for the American Mind say. They say, prepare your child for the road. Do not prepare the road for your child. That is one of the best phrases in education or parenting I've I ever heard in my life. That, yeah. is, that, is, that says it all right there. Right? Yes, yes. Um, so I wonder, uh, I wonder with the... Uh, the Charlemagne with, book, with yeah. the Charlemagne book, how they're going to speak about the economic inequality. Because to me, that's the most important thing. I know there's a lot of stuff going on with reparation right now, but that's like giving a man a fish and not teaching him to. We want this to solve the problem, mm -hmm. not put a bandaid on it for now, right? I agree. Like, you, you know, the problem with reparations, and I actually, I sort of pride myself on the fact that I really have no opinions on anything because mm. who wants to argue your, your whole life? But <laughs> people don't understand basic economics. It's not like you give $100 to somebody and they put it in the bank and that's their money forever. Exactly. No, if they're, if, particularly if they're in poverty, yep. they spend it within the first 10 minutes. They I always, pay off old bills, they buy new yeah. things, and now where's the money? Well, the yeah. money is in the hands of rich people again. And then the money I goes said, into the stock market. That's I, why the stock market went up all yeah. last year is because yeah. it started the day we passed the stimulus yeah. package because yeah. people yeah. were already putting it yeah. in the market. Every time and anybody brings up reparations, I always cite the Bush tax cuts back in, what was it, 2003? I'm like, they gave a $300 check to everybody. And what happened? Everyone, like 85 or 88 or so, I think it was 88% of people spent it that week. Yes. Yeah, it's gone. Not, they didn't put it in, in the savings account. They paid off a, an outstanding bill or whatever the fuck, or they bought some stupid shit they didn't need. Yeah. Right. People that there's, it just doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? Right. And I'm not, I'm not right. about, I'm not trying to tell people how to feel about certain issues. I would never tell, like, I don't like telling people when, where, and how to protest and stuff like that, provided it's, it's, it's uh, not violent, but ultimately I want to win. And for me, the only way we win is if we fucking win. Like, yeah. it's not me winning. It's not my group winning. It's not this, this, this. It is every single goddamn human being in America has the same uh, uh, ex expectation of some kind of benefit, right, from being in the society. If that's not the case and if people don't feel uh, uh, equity in that process, then we're fucked. Yes. And it, yeah, I, I agree. Like, I think it, it's because, again, if, if, if you're the only one who succeeds, then, you know, it kind of, you know, it, we benefit from innovation. Innovation yep. is a team effort. It's never one person. And it's too bad that our economic system is described as capitalism because mm. capitalism just means, you know, what can activities engaged in the accumulation of capital, which sounds very much like a boss exploiting labor. And mm. the reason why it sounds like that is because who invented the word capitalism? Karl Marx. Yeah. It's like yeah. If, yeah. Karl Marx defined capitalism and defined it as essentially a bad thing. The reality is our system it should be called innovationism mm -hmm. because it only our economy only grows when there's innovation. It doesn't grow when you subsidize farmers or the car industry. It grows when you let, you know, people on the edge of, of technology or the edge of industry create new things. And right. then that's how the economy grows. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's we, we've seen it over and over again. A lot of people misjudge why. World War II grew the economy so much. Now, a lot of it was loans and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. But adding women to the workforce, right? And yeah. for the first time, that innovation, if you want to call it that, uh, drove us so far forward uh, uh, by international standards. And then the GI Bill, which put, you know, low, lower middle class people through college for the first time mm -hmm. in history, created the middle class in this country yeah. for the most part. Those two innovations right back to back put us on a booming course through what? Until... Uh, 2008, I guess. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, yeah. more or less, there were hiccups here and there with the gas crisis in 79 and some of that other bullshit. But for the most part, we were on a pretty upward trajectory for a good long while. There. I mean, well, even now, like you look at increases in, you know, genomics is exponentially mm -hmm. growing, which means, pre, you know, maybe not tomorrow, but in 10 years, all medicine is basically going to be derived from you know, editing genes and, and DNA and so on. Right. Uh, robotics, AI, drones. I mean, technology has, has split off into all these different industries that are now growing in exponentially. That, you know, electric vehicles, battery, the, the length of battery power, 
all this stuff is growing exponentially and it's going to create so much opportunity. That's why it's hard to predict. Right. But what you want to do is you want to get ready for when these new industries are created. Yeah, because that's kind of like important. the end. That's, that's almost uh, not an entire one, but almost an inoculation to creative destruction, right? Creative destruction is about to become a big deal, a bigger deal than any time in our history since like the Industrial Revolution, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's about to become a serious fucking problem. That's why Andrew Yang has so much credibility in the economic circles, even though he's not necessarily an econ economist background, you know, I mean, he's made a lot of money, but just what he's talking about, he, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think he's a good man, actually. I've listened to a lot of his stuff and he's talking about universal basic income and all this shit. And that's one solution, I suppose, maybe, but is it right? I mean, that well, well, you know, it, it's interesting. So, so I, I know Andrew and, and he, he, I asked him once, why'd you run for president? And he said, uh, look, there was this, there was this, uh, lack of supply in the market of ideas mm. and i knew there was demand for new ideas right. and i had new ideas and so i run i ran and you know what the interesting thing is about the universal basic income is it almost seems like and this is points out to the 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 problems with education it seems like that's a new idea but it actually isn't no. you know who first well the president who first proposed universal basic income was Richard Nixon. So, you know, he called it negative income taxes and yeah, yeah. Andrew called it universal basic income. Right. But Alaska has so, been doing this for years. I mean, uh, citizens yeah. of Alaska get oil revenue. What's the difference? Yeah. You know right. I mean? It's the same thing. Yeah. I mean, to me, that uh, dividends from oil, UAE gets it, Kuwait gets it, Alaska gets it. I think there's some other states in the U.S. to get certain dividends for certain types of things. If not tax breaks, it's one or the other. Mm -hmm. but what's the difference right at that point? I mean, it's, I think there's some creative solutions to happen here, but I wonder if the UBI thing gets in the way of our innovation and creativity. I mean, at what point do, at what point do we get a, a narrow, a more narrow focus on ideas without the breadth that has made us so great at coming up with really creative solutions to things? You know what I mean? If, if, the, if we're just getting dividends and we're not actually invested in something, right? How do we, how do we inform business and how it grows from here as a, as a society? Yeah, I mean, I think both both Andrew and economists would say that um, you got to keep it low enough that no one's going to say, oh, my gosh, thank God I got my fourteen hundred dollars check. I'm all set now. Right. I'm rich. <laughs> like, yeah, it, it really is just intended to be like a bridge between like one industry failing because of innovation and another I industry starting because of innovation. So it gives you right. a little bridge to, to reeducate yourself. Yeah. And, and I know, you know that, that learned, could be valuable. So that learned to code phrase is callous. It's been used callously, but it's not wrong. You know what I mean? Right. Like you have to accept what, what did Carl Sagan said? It's, it's far better for me to grasp reality as it is and suffer in, or persist in delusion regardless of how gratifying it is. You have to think that way. If you, you can't be romantic about the things that you're doing at the time because they could go away just like that. You know what I mean? Right. Particularly if you're relying on, you know, other sources Anybody of else. like, like look at all the companies that depended on Twitter as their platform yeah. or it depended on Amazon as a platform. Yeah. But then if Amazon says, no, we don't want to work with you anymore. You're out of business. Right. Exactly. So, uh, and, and that's Amazon's choice. No one controls them. Like they're control, they're a public company. They can choose well, what they want to for do now. Right. I mean, do you think there's a point that, that's a good segue into this? Do you think there's a point where social media companies, Amazon, who does publishing and et cetera, et cetera, become de facto public utilities in the same way that the phone company did back in the day? That's, a, that, that's the question that they, we've all been, everybody's been debating because, you know, does Twitter have the right to have an opinion and shut down some accounts but not others? Right. And this has been a legal question since 1995. Mm. Uh, and my view is that they have admitted that they are a, a so, so obviously free speech people always bring up, but free speech only happens if I say something on the street to you, yeah. you and I can't be arrested for what we say right, right, right. in public right. on government property. Um, cause the, uh, the government essentially owns the sidewalk mm. and, and, but if you could say something in a, on a private company like Twitter, they can restrict you. But the question is what happens when they're the only way people communicate Right. Right? Like take it to yeah. an extreme. And Twitter is kind of, for many people, the, the only way they communicate. And it becomes, even Jack Dorsey said, we're like a public, like we're like the public um, square of a town, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, of a village. That was a mistake and, of him to say that, by the way, because that's yeah. definitely coming back in a court case later <laughs> on, for sure. Yeah, no, I mean, if, I, if it was an issue, everybody should sue Twitter uh, based on that one line, because yep. there are court precedents where if a company, for instance, 
takes over the government responsibilities of running a town, then they have to allow constitutional rights. Oh, actually, there's, so there's, it, so there's case law on this. So if, if, if a police officer calls a security guard and says, hey, I need you to do this, and the security guard does it, uh, and it's unconstitutional, the security guard has violated the constitutional rights of that person. They could be judged as such, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I had to learn that when I was doing bodyguard workout in California back in the way. Uh, back really? In the day. Yeah, it's, yeah. Very, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And the same thing happens with contractors, like uh, Northrop Grumman and uh, what, what's the one that, uh, that Homeboy that leaked all the stuff worked for? I can't remember the name uh, of that shit. company. Yeah. Anyways, it doesn't matter. They, they could be uh, held accountable for unconstitutional shit as well because they're doing stuff on behalf of the federal government, right? So that's, that is a, that's a real thing for sure. And it's interesting that that comes up. So obviously the government's not paying Twitter. Well, campaigns are paying Twitter, clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, but the government at large is not paying Twitter. So at what point, I wonder what, what it's going to take case law wise for something for that case to be made. It's going to have to be class action for sure. It's going to have oh, to be bigger than just one person. I, I think the fact that they even view themselves as a public square, mm. that they've self-identified as that, or at least Jack Dorsey has, then, you know, that's kind of all you need to basically say, well, then you, if you're providing the services of a public square, particularly during an economic lockdown where people aren't allowed outside and you say well, you're a public square, then constitutionally you have to be treated like a public square, which means you have to allow freedom of speech. I, I would make that argument. And, and I think that argument is already done. Like they, and meaning no one's pressed this in court, but I bet you that could be pressed in court. And there's case law on that. For sure. So, I mean, who's going to, I, I did always wonder, not that we ever, who is it? Though. Yeah. Who's it going to be? Cause I mean, if you look at the, the dominion software thing, right. Yeah. Um, they're suing everybody and their mother yeah. and, uh, but and then, then parlor as well. Yeah. Got yeah. Booted off to, uh, Trump, yeah. Trump is allegedly working on his own media company right now, which I think was, I think they would have been better off suing the federal government or not suing the federal government, suing Twitter. Suing Twitter. Right? Yeah, I yeah. think that would have been a better solution for him. Not that I like the fans of the show. know I don't really give two fucks about Donald Trump, but him getting shut down and stuff like that and the way it happened was kind of problematic the way some of his stuff was censored in the way the, the that it wasn't applied equally and all that stuff it's just not it's bad business but uh i wonder why why he I'll Tim, I, I have the answer to this well, it's actually about, it's about money it's about That's money answer, yeah because yeah. financially to take on a twitter uh legally mm. Is going to require not only endless time, but uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars. And Twitter can just keep throwing money at their but lawyers. Presumably, Donald Trump could do the same, right? He could, but I, I think what's what's most interesting is uh, the the My Pillow guy did right. Mm -hmm. the, the My Pillow guy went against Dominion and said, "Great, you're going to sue me. I'll counter sue you. That way, it, hopefully, in the discovery, this is what he's hoping. Yeah, obviously, yeah. that he's going to get some information on the voting machines and all that other thing." But that guy has a billion dollars for real that we know about, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know how much Donald Trump has because no, he's I mean, got so much invested in, liquid, in a bunch of his liquid assets. Who the fuck knows? Right. Yeah. So but, to, to take on a, a case that big, it's got to be class action, and it's mm. got to be lawyers who are willing to do it. And I think we don't have an example of people going against big tech no. where they've won yet. And you have to be able to apply to to go against the government in general or to go against anybody, but particularly against the government and get or get the government involved in going against somebody on your behalf. You need to uh, you need the press, mm -hmm. right? You have to have the press you, talking you about what's press, going on. And and by the way, the press needs the government. So, oh, for sure. So, yeah. the, the, you know, or at least one side of the government or the other. Right. But like, you, nobody can sue Google on the basis of anything because who is the biggest lobbyist in Congress? You would think a cigarette maker or a car maker Google. or whatever, or an alcohol you know, seller, but Google is the biggest lobbyist yeah. in Congress because these issues do come up and they are squashed very fast. That's like a, yeah. a friend of mine once legitimately had the patent for a lot of what Google does. He, he had started, he was involved in a company called Lycos back in the 90s, which was one of the oh, first- Oh, I remember engines. Lycos, yeah. 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 Yeah, and so Lycos was ultimately its intellectual assets were bought by some small firm in India. Mm -hmm. My friend bought back his patent that he had originally sold to Lycos, and he sued Google on the basis of his patent. And he was winning. And he won, I think he won in local court. He won the court case, and he won, won an appeals court. But then the government put together this tribunal. They pulled some other 90-year-old judge out of retirement, and they said it had to be unanimous to go over this case and review it. And it instantly got shut down. Oof, man. So, oof. And I, my friend had put millions into it. This sounds and a lot like he, was, uh, so, he went crazy after that. I'm sure yeah. you've heard, uh, or I'm sure you've probably read The Master Switch by Tim Wu as well, right? No, God no, I've read it. that. You should oh, just you put should. the fucking book on your desk at this I point. Know. I know. I talk about episode. it almost every single day. 
but right, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna buy it now. Yeah. Me, I'm going back and forth to Amazon the whole time. Absolutely. Here. God damn Don't it! Read just that. put the fucking book. It's gonna, up. It's yeah. gonna be the me, me and I'll touch your fucking book club. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, that one. What you're describing, how the government gets involved in this stuff and kind of uh, ca- casually looks away as monopolies grow, and then even facilitates them growing for two reasons: one, because monopolies will pay them. Yeah. And two, because uh, they want more power. Yeah. That's it, right? And everybody else is willing to sell into a monopoly because they're going to make money. And they're yeah. like, well, fuck it. But now the monopolies, again, for the second time in the last hundred years, become uh, uh, digital media. So now, yeah. we're, that now we're fucked again, right? Well, actually, it's the third time. If you, it's the third time in about 140 years if you include the telephone. But if you think about the way media began in, the, in this country and, and how it's going now, every single time they've been complicit in this shit. So to hold politicians accountable, the way to do that is in mass, right? Mm-hmm. You have to be in mass because you're affecting their voting block. That's the only, only thing they care about is power, more power. So to do that, you need the press, right? As it exists today, but you also need social media. Yeah. And social, again, like Congress is not gonna vote itself out of a job or out of money. So you think they're gonna fucking allow this shit to happen? You think they're gonna allow the, the policing of social media that's, that's in their pocket? There's no fucking, or the, whose pocket they're in? There's no yeah, way. there's no way. I don't see this ending. Do you see an end to it? I don't, I don't see an ending. And I, I, I think, I mean, there's a, technically there's a solution. I, I don't want to seem kind of wonky about it, but like crypt, crypto Blockchain, or decentralized sure. yep. technology can allow for a social media network that can't be controlled by some centralized force. But I just don't realistically see that happening anytime soon because we're all addicted to Twitter. I mean, basically everyone's a closet epidemiologist right now on Twitter. <laughs> like that's where they go out to get out their ex- epidemiology urges now. Yeah. <laughs> we're, all, we're all like uh, cyclical experts, I guess, is what yeah. I, the, the phrase I've been using. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, um, James, I, look, you're, you're an unbelievably amazing guy. Um, we you. could talk to you well, for so hours and hours and hours. To go on or yeah. show to go on. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna read your latest book. Uh, skip the line. Skip the line. I'm gonna add it to my book club, and we'll, once once I'm ready, uh, we'll have you on back on to discuss it. Uh, after yeah, that'd be that awesome. Stuff. I love it. Absolutely. And, and now's the point in the show we get to the drinking bro of the week, which is someone who has inspired you or helped you become the person you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? It can also be a, a woman as yeah, well. Phil Spe- bro I think Phil Spector is, is that? Phil Spector <laughs> is uh, up there. Um, or OJ, he's right there. Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, you might be a stand-in for Malcolm Gladwell as well. Uh, we have um, him coming on next month, actually. We do, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah, Malcolm's a good guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Barton uh, Fink. Some uh, of our producers are yelling out Barton wait, Fink. Wait, who's Barton Fink? Uh, that was the Cohen Brothers movie. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was the, uh, mm. John Turturro played Barton Fink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, with the yeah. guy with the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait, look, was, you got a great, you got a great head, head also. I forget who a razor head was because that was a Cohen. That was a Cohen brothers. Oh no, was that David Lynch or the Cohen brothers? Mm. Uh, razor heads, probably David Lynch, right? Hold on, yeah, look. I think yeah, it's, it's David Lynch. Lynch yeah. yeah, he used to. I used uh, to live in Madison, Wisconsin, by the way. He was there was this weird place that he hung out there, like velvet all over the walls and shit. Oh yeah, that's Very David bizarre. Lynch. Yeah, that's he's classic David Lynch. Yeah, a razor head. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? I I hate to cop out, but I there there's a I feel like I learn a lot of things from a lot of people like. Take Picasso. I don't want to be like him in some ways, but the fact that he created 50,000 works of art, mm. I really think being prolific is, is – quantity is more important than quality because if you have a lot of quantity, some quality will happen, which was obviously the case <laughs> with, with him. But I'm also going to say I had this one professor in school who – he wanted to be a computer science professor, but he didn't, he didn't have – he didn't study – he never studied computer science. He was a physicist by training. And so – and he got rejected as on all his jobs. He applied to be a, a professor. And so he went to one school and put up a sign, at 7 p.m. tonight, I'm gonna to teach a class about you know X, Y, Z and computer science. And a few students showed up, then he was a great teacher, more students showed up, more students. And then he, the entire computer science department was showing up for all his classes every night, and they finally offered him a job. So somebody like that is very inspirational to me. Someone who basically chooses himself and, and makes it happen, even after everybody's rejected him and told him, you can't do that. Right. Man, That's I, awesome. That's yeah, this is this has been genuinely one of my favorite shows mm-hmm. we've ever done. And this is oh, why. Thank you so I, much. You guys. I, so look, like you were saying, uh, putting out uh, creativity and, and yeah, quantity, yeah. I guess, uh, is, is kind of what we do. We're on every single day between this and, and the other show I do. I think I've done like sixteen hundred or seventeen hundred episodes total. This is like a top 10 for me, for sure. Oh, like, excellent. Dude, yeah. you're... He uh, was, you got to go listen to him on uh, Keating's show as well. Brian Keating's a buddy of ours. Uh, we, we do some stuff with him here and there. You were on not too long ago, right? 
Yeah, yeah, no, here. Brian's a good friend of mine. He's yeah. he's he is super smart. Like that yeah. guy is a smart guy. He is. Yeah, we're in we're in a little we're in some clubhouse groups together where we do some weird shit over there. Not yeah, and I, I heard you with Tim Dillon on your show as well. Mm. And uh, oh yeah, and that was a great one as well. I'm a huge see, see, Tim Dillon. Fan. See, like in, in comedy, for instance, Tim Dillon, Chris Stefano, Tony Woods, mm. these people uh, are, have, are they're either already legends or they're up and coming in a fast way, and they they've inspired me. And uh, you know, you learn you learn something from everyone. Like you know, t t Tim Dillon is great at just ranting off the top of his head and mm. it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. Chris Sofano is like the best co comedic storyteller out there. And you know, you know, then you have guys like, you know, L Louis CK, who's just such a classically great joke writer mm -hmm. that it's just, it's like unbelievable how good he is at joke writing. And, and you don't appreciate it till you know the nuances of comedy, but then you see, oh my gosh, this guy is like, the world champion of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. We were at a Bill Burr show about, what, three months ago? Mm -hmm. And uh, like three quarters of the way through the joke, sometimes halfway through the joke, I'm already like, oh, this is good. And the, the uh, person who was sitting next to me is like, what are you talking about? The joke's not over. I'm like, just watch. Because you can see the structure. Yeah. He's such yeah. a smart comedian. Yeah. And the guys that do it really well like that are so impressive to watch. I mean, holy shit. Like, we're technically comedians, but those guys are fucking comedians. You know what I mean? Putting, grinding it out, yep. coming up with an hour plus long special that all ties in together. That's that is fucking work. It's oh yeah, work. yeah, for sure. To perfect the timing and everything. Yeah, I love it. Same. Uh, hey, you were welcome back anytime. You have a, a standing cool. invite on this show, man. Yeah. You were rad. Uh, this is this is one of the best shows. Uh, oh, by the way, before we ever. go, you guys are suing Stand Up New York, which you're a part owner in, which is a comedy yeah, club yeah. up there. You guys are suing the city or the state government or city government. What's going on up there? State government, yeah, because. And this has happened in other states too. I believe Minnesota. I mean, basically everywhere the economics, uh, the economic lockdowns have been, um, have happened, which is all over the U.S. It's against the Constitution. You yeah. cannot deprive someone of the right to make a living without due process. Mm. I mean, maybe you could say, "Hey, it's a national emergency. We need you to stay home for a week or two weeks." And I understand, like this pandemic is very real. People are dying from it. People mm. are getting sick. It's horrible. But just purely on the basis of the Constitution, you cannot deprive someone of the right to make a living without due process. That's Correct. the law. That's yep. the fundamental law since 1789 in the United States of America. So we're suing on that basis, and, and other people who have sued on that basis have won. Yeah. So, you know, like the shutdown, I believe it was either Minnesota or Wisconsin, the state had to reopen because of uh, well, shit. Uh, the courts. Here, our state government. Uh, almost had to sue the city of Austin, right? Uh, they're they're close like, now. Yeah, yeah. there's yeah. a couple of times. And our buddy Ian Smith, he runs that gym in New Jersey. I'm sure you've heard about as well. That's getting fined like fifteen thousand dollars a day by the state of New Jersey or mm -hmm. some shit. But you know, fuck them, right? Yeah. Ultimately, you, you know, it is it is this. Some of this conflict is good. Con like chemotherapy is conflict, right? It's radiation killing cells inside of your body. A lot of those cells are fucking harmful and it gets rid of some bullshit. Bad right. ideas don't get exposed in silence. Sometimes you got to make a little noise. Yeah. It's just yeah. the way it is. And we appreciate you being out there making fucking noise and, and speaking genuinely about things and not being a, frankly, not being a pussy. Yeah. A lot of people are so risk averse these days and no one is ever yeah. fucking won by trying not to lose. Not one. No, I, I always say I don't like to write anything unless I'm afraid of what people will think of me after this is published. Mm. And because otherwise then someone else has already written it. If there's right. no fear, then someone else has probably already said this idea. Right. But, you know, I think when I wrote this article about New York City, uh, it, w it was like 30 million people read it and a million people hated it. So a small percentage, yeah. but I heard from every single one of those million people. <laughs> that I'm was sure. a bit uh, above and beyond for me. Like, I even had some comedians who I had helped in the past mm. or whatever were, were absolute dicks because they just wanted to stay on Seinfeld's side. By the way, I like Seinfeld. I, af, after his article came out, a few weeks after that, his book came out, Is This Anything? I thought that was a good book. Like, I enjoyed reading it. I have nothing against Seinfeld, even though he, like, trashed me in front of 20 million people, but <laughs> yeah. whatever. Yeah, what do you mean New York is dead? Why is it dead? Why is it dead, James? Uh, <laughs> Skip the Line is the name of the book. The 10,000 Experiments. Uh, rule and other surprising advice for reaching your goals. It is out now. Please check it out. It's available on all platforms. Kindle, audiobook, hardcover, and paperback. Amazon is the easiest way to get it. James, thank you for being here. For Danthony so Anthony Holloway, I am Ross Patterson. We are the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone.